All right, guys, welcome back to the Guest List Podcast. This is the first episode that is on video. So thank you, Lance, for coming on and being the test on me. Uh, Lance Growlick is the owner and founder of Ion Franchising. What exactly is a franchise? We're about to find out and everything around it. So thank you, Lance, for coming on. Thanks for having me, Jake. Yeah, I, pre- I appreciate you. Uh, nice, nice to be in your domain, in your world. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, it's a little uh, it's a little nifty in here. Uh, brand new building. Unfortunately, when I first set up for the video podcasting, I wanted to be able to uh, show the, the stratosphere that looks out this window. But as I realized... Um, I'm not, I wasn't very smart as far as the video quality and realized that I couldn't have the window uh, uh. open during recording because <laughs> of the lighting, <laughs> the lighting issues. <laughs> Oops. Hey, fun fact. I was the opening food and beverage dir- director at the Stratosphere. Really? Back in, was that 96? I think it's 96. That's an easy Google search. How, how was that opening? It was crazy. It was fun. I, I am a big opening sort of specialist. I like the beginnings, if you will. I'm not so much a maintainer. That's boring. So I like the <laughs> openings. And uh, yeah, I had a, a friend that was the VP of food and beverage for the Stratosphere in the early days. I did the hard hat tour in a rickety elevator up the side of the Stratosphere oh. before the permanent elevators were in. That was fun. I should have recorded that, but that was 96. So I don't know what I would have recorded it on. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody today knows, especially your age. Um, (laughs) But no, it was it was a blast and uh, had a lot of fun and had about seven hundred people in the seven fifty or so employees and did about fifty million a year in food and beverage. So it was popular its first few years. And well, Stratosphere always did well in food and beverage. There was a lot of people coming there, and not a lot of them were gambling in the beginning. And and unfortunately, in the world of business, which we're going to talk about more obviously today. you know, if you don't finance yourself appropriately, you, you could have problems. You know, you got to you have to be able to overcome that debt. And as I recall, the Stratosphere was essentially funded with junk bond financing. I think it was probably fourteen percent interest, oh and uh, and it was just it was too much. But uh, I think it was Carl Icahn that came in next and took it over, and which is what he's known to do. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it it was cash flowing right away because he bought it for uh, a fair price market value based on their ca- you know, cash flow. And, and he made it into a success. It already was a success, but not, you know, financially yeah, on paper. He's still floating around there. I think he just got involved in, was it the Tropicana or one of these smaller ones where he yeah. bought it for 300 mil and then flipped it for 600 million yeah, like he, a few years later. He has, uh, there's a lot of people that don't know his name, but he is one of those billionaires that has been so successful since the seventies buying, um, buying on opportunity. And especially during times like right now, um, you know, guys like Mark Cuban are out there saying, you know, crisis breeds opportunity. You know, millionaires will become billionaires from this time period. And people that don't have much could easily become millionaires if they're looking in the right places and looking at the right opportunities. Oh, yeah, that's me with a, I'm a big Bitcoin proponent. My audience is probably mad that I threw it in there, but I have to yeah. any opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. any uh, hard assets right now is definitely where to go if you're if you're investing because yeah. the dollar is just getting depreciated. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, unfortunately my dad passed in March and uh, I was back in New York for a month helping my mom with him. And, and the reason I bring that up is uh, not only did I get coronavirus while I was in New York, but I also, uh, you know, as I was saying goodbye to my dad, he'd been sick for so many years. He was a big Wall Street guy. And, um, you know, Bitcoin and any other sort of alternative investments, you know, wasn't anything that my family or my dad would ever even look at (laughs) because he was so successful on Wall Street. And and there's still a buying opportunities out there today. Um, Plenty of plenty of money to be made, you know, in in, I don't want to say day trading, but, you know, Mm -hmm. dad hated that. You know, he was (laughs) he was a buy and hold guy. His license plate was blue chip. Look for good companies and hold. I like you know, that. Get, out, get Amazon at the, in the early days and hold. I mean, if you would have bought Amazon, if you would have bought Apple in the early days, um, you know, Walmart, so many brands out there and just, just buy and hold. That's, that's kind of my ethos as well. Um, also, there's so many different tax brackets and different things that surround day trading that a lot of times these day traders end up losing money at the end of the day. Well, there's, of it. there's no doubt. It's, 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 I guess, a blessing if you make a lot of money, you pay your capital gains tax mm-hmm. you know, on, the, on the, what you gained and what you, what you profited. Um, but you know, it's all the cost to do in business. So 
tell me, you said you were in New York and you caught COVID. This is, was this back in March? Yes, I was there uh, middle of March to um, end of March. I'm sorry, end of February to the end of March. Was it a war zone like the media made it out to be? Not where I was. I was in Long Island with my family. So I didn't go anywhere. Um, pretty much was, was helping mom with dad and, and other nurses and caretakers. He was in hospice by that time. And, um, you know, he went too quickly, but he was terminal. And, um, you know, that's when we're watching the news and all the scare tactics, all these mm -hmm. things popping up in the media about what's going on. And, you know, but we were, we were isolated. We were locked down before there was an official lockdown. And, you know, my sister wasn't really feeling well. And then my brother-in-law wasn't really feeling well. And my sister thought she had the flu. Her doctor thought she had the flu. I had some weird little minor, minor cough, the dry cough that they keep talking mm -hmm. about. And um, a few days before I was ready to go back to Vegas, you know, my, my wife and kids had come up to visit, um, you know, say their final goodbyes as well. So I was with them. And all of a sudden I woke up in the morning with a big migraine. And I was like, wow, I don't, I don't ever get headaches. I was like, whoa, I think that's a symptom of the coronavirus. And then I had felt some body aches. And so three days later I get on a plane and go back to Vegas, go to my doctor and she looks at me and here's what I have. And she goes, yep, yeah, you probably have it. Gave me the flu test. Turned out I didn't have the flu. Gave me the results of the flu test right away. Four and a half, five days later, she calls me and says, yep, you're positive. Just, you're fine. Just, you're healthy. Don't worry about it. And I, and I, I recovered quickly. Um, it was lingering silly little symptoms, but I'm lucky I'm healthy. I mean, I think that's really, I think the media is blowing it up in some cases, but uh, it's an awful thing. You know, and there are people dying and, you know, take precautions. Well, I'm, I'm glad you are healthy and that, you know, you made it through. The majority of people do do pull through. Um, I had a, a nurse on here before. She had the first coronavirus patient. Oh, wow. um, she works on the respiratory division. And the first month in Vegas, she said that the average age in the ICU was around like 50s and 60s. And it was like obese. Yeah. And now this time around... You, the hospitalizations are up, but the average age has dropped between into like the twenties and thirties Yeah, it's from when we, we reopened. It's like anything. The unknown is scary. And, and that's really the issue. There's still all these months into coronavirus and there's still so much unknown and there's conflicting information and nobody really, I don't think anybody really knows what's, what's right. So shelter in place, wear a mask, don't touch your face, your nose, your eyes. You know, I was at the gym today and a, and a, and a, lady is wearing a mask and we all are and and she's touching her eyes and then she's scratching her ears and i'm like okay don't you understand that those are you don't do that yeah <laughs> that's how these germs <laughs> spread <laughs> yeah there's so much confusion um but I th humanity always ends up pulling through every situation no demand so it will pass it seems like it's a scary situation but i have a lot of faith in humanity so i think that we'll pull through and uh touching on the unknowns that's something that you are very familiar with as you said before you you oftentimes find yourself in the very beginning of different startups that have ventured into now i mean you have your own company now with franchising and that's a little bit more in the later stages um, what other kind of experiences do you have in the beginning startups of, across your life? So I think it should be said that, you know, for someone like myself, I was, I felt lucky that I grew up in a family that was very entrepreneurial. So I got to see sort of the, the plan, if you will. And, you know, there's a whole nature versus nurture sort of discussion, argument, people theorize what, you know, who, how do you become an entrepreneur? Is this something environmental you hated your, your, your job, your J-O-B, which usually stands for just over broke. <laughs> and, you, and you don't want to be a W-2 employee anymore. And, or, and you just, you know, like during the coronavirus right now, I'm dealing with a lot of people that are, uh, have been forced out, told to, you know, take early retirement from a company they've been at for 20 years plus. And uh, so about half, to, half my clientele is, is those corporate refugees that are kind of forced out. But, uh, but back to your, your real question, um, I started an entrepreneurial family. I knew at a young age that I would probably be an entrepreneur, but I felt that I needed to really, you know, push myself to learn what it's like to be in the real world and be a W2 employee and explore. And when I, I, I thought I was going to work for dad actually originally on wall street and 
did that throughout high school, did that throughout college or after college, I should say. And I was bored. I was bored being in New York. I know that sounds funny for people that aren't in New York. Oh my gosh, everybody wants to go to New York. New York City is fantastic, but it's a big concrete jungle. Um, there, are, there are parks. There, are, there is some greenery, but there's a lot of people. And I said, you know, I had an uncle that made money in tech, pseudo uncle. He's my uncle's best friend. We called him an uncle. Made a lot of money in tech before anybody did in the 70s and did really well for himself. And he wanted to build a billion dollar company. So he said, I, I called me and said, I heard you bored. I'm going to buy four TGI Friday's restaurants in Phoenix, Arizona. And I was like, perfect. I'd love to go west. He goes, well, get on a plane, check it out, see if you like it. And, uh, and I loved it. And that was my start on the West Coast. And I was with TGI Friday's for five years. Now, the glory and the glamour of what I did, leaving a Wall Street job that could have made me a fortune, you know, working there and having an opportunity that most people don't even get. And I started as a host at TGI Fridays. Oh, right at the bottom. For eight fifty an hour. <laughs> yes, $8.50 an hour. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Stephen. <laughs> and I worked my way up to an area manager position. Um, and I was kind of a troubleshooter. I went store to store to help out. Um, I always had a good attention to detail. Um, but I, I loved the restaurant business throughout college. I was a bouncer in a bar, bartender, what have you. I did whatever I could in, in college and hospitality and really enjoyed it. That's another funny story because my mother yelled at me one day and found out I had a job and yelled at me for having a job because in my family, it was get in and out of college in four years, you know, don't pass, go collect $200, whatever the old monopoly little saying, you know, just do the college thing and get the hell out and get a real job with dad. And, you know, and, uh, you know, so it was my grandfather's that were really entrepreneurial. Dad had investments, but mom and dad really wanted me to just get a real job with him. So with TGI Fridays, I had a blast, loved it, got kind of the, the bug, got, got bit by the bug of franchising in the restaurant business. And uh, after about five years through acquisitions, by the way, that TGI Fridays franchise grew to be the largest franchise group with TGI Fridays very successful. Um, many people listening might not even, they, they might think of TGI Fridays today and go, ew, that's not so good today. But TGI Fridays was was it in the old days. And and we had Fridays locations that did, you know, $4 million a year in sales in the late 80s at, you know, $2.50 a draft beer, not on happy hour. So can you imagine how much beer that was by today's standards where beer is what? six bucks that's that's low ball on yeah. it even I, it, if you go um even to the nightclubs that's more expensive one beer is like twelve dollars at, oh, yeah. at my old nightclub job oh, of course no but uh, you know typical restaurants today five six bucks seven bucks whatever it might be you know we were talking 250 in the old days not on happy hour and uh so huge volume but we were doing we ended up doing through acquisitions of, of additional restaurants and building our own after five years, we had 60 something stores, 63 or four stores doing over 225 million in revenue. So it was a hell of an experience for me. Um, the gentleman that really ran that entire franchise, who was a certified Fridays operator, obviously I was new to Fridays in the restaurant business in those days. He's still my mentor today and, and a gentleman that refers a lot of business to me. So I love him. Thank you, Ken, if you're listening. <laughs> so, um, but no, fast forward, I picked up consulting projects and realized that I'm, I'm a good restaurant operator. I know more than most operators today because of this Friday's training. At TGI Fridays in the old days, especially as a, as a manager, you needed at least six months of training. Well, six months was the training program. If you knew certain things, like I had bartended in college, so that cut my training time to mm -hmm. be a bartender. And I, I, f I was fast tracked on that, that management training program with Fridays, but it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, we probably don't have enough time today to talk about the fact that, you know, colleges don't always teach what are things that we need in life. Yes. No, you know? let's dive into it. We've got yeah. time. We've got some, <laughs> we've got time. <laughs> no, but, but, you know, being, you know, the real life, the, the world of the restaurant business, it's been said many times by a lot of different people that, you know, I think everybody in life should be a waiter at some point or a server or a bartender and really serve people. And, you know, uh, I mean, I can tell you stories. I was, when I was a waiter at a TGI Fridays, when I was in training, 
to, to be a waiter at Fridays and management training, part of the management training program. Um, the, the servers giggled and said, oh, let Lance take him. It's like, who's him? Who's him? Oh, apparently there was a regular that was super grumpy that nobody liked. But he obviously liked the food. He got adequate service that he kept coming back and he sort of had a regular table. So I said, sure. But puffed up my chest and I said, absolutely, I'll take him. And uh, I killed him with kindness and I treated him like he wasn't an asshole. I, I was super nice to him and gave him the attention that everybody wants, regardless of the fact that everybody said that he's, he's difficult and he's not pleasant. And uh, when, I, when I dropped the check on his, to his table, when it was all said and done, he kind of grabbed my, my arm and, you know, lightly and just said, I got to tell you something. You know, these servers here I know don't even like me because I'm a crotchety old man and I have an attitude. I know what I am, but that's just me. I come here because the, the staff is, is generally very friendly. It's an upbeat place. I like the music you play. I love the food. And that's why I come here. You gave me the best service I have ever gotten in any restaurant, and I really do appreciate that. You made my day. And I thought to myself, wow, that's really what hospitality is all about. And every restaurant that I've had since, and we could talk about that. I've been in the restaurant business a long time in Vegas, and I have rest, have I had some concepts that you probably don't even know about that were successful in Vegas, uh, one in particular. And uh, But I loved it. I loved hospitality, loved the restaurant business. So, you know, you fast forward many years later, and I became a Wingstop franchisee. I opened up all the wing stops in Vegas. I had the rights to all of that, all the wing stops in uh, Clark County. We thank you for that. All the UNLV students, thank you for well, that. Well, you one. are quite welcome. Actually, the one on Maryland Parkway, the big one close to UNLV, was not me. After I sold all of my stores to corporate, um, that location was built by corporate. And I would have told him no. I would have told him never, do, do not build over there because I would have built it on Flamingo kind of like where Raising Cane's is in, mm -hmm. that, in that area right now. So it's more visible and more accessible. Once you go towards the mall, it's a little, little bit less traffic and less desirable, I guess you can say. But uh, nevertheless, I was uh, successful with Wingstop, one of the top 1% of all franchisees. But, you know, I had partnership problems. I made, you know, Jake, we don't have enough time to talk about all my mistakes. <laughs> but as my mother once said to me, and she laughed just like you're smiling at me right now, my mother once said to me, she said, you got it. You know how to make money. You know how to build businesses. Yeah, you made mistakes with partners and you screwed some things up that you'd rather take back. But once you have that skill, nobody can take that away from you. And you can create business after business after business. And, uh, and that's what I've done. And I did realize at some point, we could fill in the holes in my story here if you'd like, but you know, all these years later in franchising, I became a Krispy Kreme franchisee. I became a Krispy Kreme franchisee because I was invited into a partnership, friend of the family had Krispy Kreme. They were the first Krispy Kreme franchisees in New York City. And they met the gentleman that became the second franchisee for Krispy Kreme, again, many years ago. And that gentleman became the franchisee for Krispy Kreme for the state of Nevada and Utah. And he asked for advice on an operator how do you, how do you find and recruit the best operator? Because he wasn't going to operate all these stores himself in Vegas and Utah or Nevada and Utah. And he recommended me. So the gentleman that was the franchisee and still is, I think for Nevada and Utah, um, called me and we became fast friends. He hired someone else to be his operator initially because he realized I was too expensive. And, uh, we became fast friends. And when they, the initial operator didn't work out, he called me, but I, we were in touch the whole time. I saw the Spring Mountain store open. I did over $120,000 opening week. Wow. But that was like at $3.29 for a glaze dozen, if I remember correctly. And now they're like, what, seven ninety nine or eight ninety nine a dozen glaze? For a dozen, it's probably more than that. Yeah, well, you know, so that's just appreciation. I mean, sugar in those days and soybean oil was pretty cheap. All the typical, it's probably a little bit better quality back then too. Yeah. Well, I don't know that they changed much up, but Krispy Kreme was a, was definitely an interesting story or pit stop in my life. And I was there for several years, really as the managing partner and, and one of the owners, and did incredibly well. 
Um, but you know, after that, I you know I got divorced, and there was a whole bunch of you white know, again, life came into play. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I I'm a great beginner. I'm a great starter. Uh, I'm great at doing the hard stuff. The hard, you know, people always talk about, oh my gosh, how do I open a restaurant? Well, opening a restaurant's not easy. Once you have learned, it's again, it's like a muscle. You you have it, and and you could figure it out again. Um, and in my case though, the maintaining of restaurants, once you have it staffed, once you have a good manager, it's, it's kind of boring, <laughs> but, uh, you know, all these years later, I realized, you know, I like, I love, don't like, I love the franchise world. I love that it's, you can take a proven brand like Krispy Kreme, like Wingstop and be successful. I mean, but you know, you'll laugh. My first Wingstop in Las Vegas only did $5,000 opening week selling chicken wings. That was it. And that's because of brand awareness. But my fourth store, when it opened a few years later, you couldn't get into it and did about $33,000 opening week. It's because you, you understood through trial and error. Well, it was also brand awareness. It's like Starbucks. When Starbucks first started opening stores, they were doing 300,000 in sales, 350, and that's it. And then they were tweaking and adding items. And, you know, and then all of a sudden years later, their average store is a million and change or whatever it is. It's just the evolution of a brand. When I joined Wingstop, the average store was doing 600,000 in sales. Now it's over a million, you know, unaffected by coronavirus because they were already into, well into delivery and takeout and mm -hmm. well ahead of the curve where, you know, the Chili's and the TGI Fridays and the Applebee's of the world were dead in the water because you have all this big building to fill and nobody can come in and eat. So, um, but you know, the, the bottom line for me is I gravitated into franchise development started doing it, you know, 15 years ago, probably. And people kept asking me, Hey, can you help sell my brand? Sure. Of course I can. I'm a natural salesperson, but really what I do is more of a referral type thing. I find people that want franchises and you know, most of them don't necessarily know what they want. Some people come to me and say, I don't want a restaurant. I don't know what I want, but I don't want a restaurant. I heard it's too hard. Where the other half come to me, like a gentleman I just got off the phone with before I walked in with you, he's an attorney. He wants a restaurant. A friend of mine from another restaurant brand called me and said, hey, this guy's great. It didn't really work out with our brand because we only, we only represent one brand. And he, you know, we have somebody else already in the market, but I think he'd be a great franchisee. So I'm helping him find a restaurant franchise that is appropriate that he would love. And um, so today I represent almost 600 franchise brands more brands than anybody in the U S and I work for free. I provide free services to anybody looking, finding people, their perfect franchise. And I get paid by my brands. I have negotiated commissions that are structured that when I successfully complete, um, a referral that, that goes to a deal, I get paid. And, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful business to feel good about changing people's lives. It's a very noble proposition. I like that. I think I'm a really big proponent on it's almost like it's a commission-based job, you know, because that's, it. that's when people work hourly jobs, you're just going through the motions. It's very mechanical. But when you know that you have to rely on yourself to get paid, that's where you're happy. That's where your, your personality shines yep. and everything. So I, I'm curious, you said that you get paid by the franchi franchise. Is it franchisees? Franchisor. Franchisor is the one that- Is okay. the parent company, the yes. Parent. Okay, and then the franchisees. Who approaches you more? Is it people looking for businesses or people or the, the franchise or is looking to expand outwards? Oh, well, I, you know, great question. So last year, as an example, I realized that I had no IV infusion brands in my portfolio. None of the brokers that I'm associated with had any in their, in their portfolios. And I had them with several brokers, one really huge broker. And so I said to myself, I need to find an IV infusion brand. So I went on a search and I found one amazing IV infusion brand. And then of course the brokers brought in two additional great IV infusion brands. So now I have three. So sometimes I don't have to look that hard to recruit. People love when I call them brands mm -hmm. and they know I'm experienced. They know I've been a franchisee of multiple brands. I've started up quite a few brands uh, successfully. So the franchisors like dealing with me because they know they're going to get a professional that understands the process. And, and really it's a referral relationship because I, I'm not, I mean, 
some people call what I do heavy lifting and that I have to sift through a lot of people that maybe aren't ready and really determine who's best to say, you know, Jake, that business would be great for you. Let me make an introduction for you. Contact the brand like I did this morning for a few people and the brand picks it up from there. Sometimes I participate in the entire process if people want that, um, which I'm more than happy to do. Some people want me on all the, call, all the calls to support them better. Other people are like, no, 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 I got, it, I got it from here, Lance. I don't need you. I'll call you for your advice after I speak to them. So to fully answer what you said, really it's all franchisees for the most part that I'm talking to on a, on a pretty regular or prospective franchisees, I should say. Candidates, I call them. And, you know, I do a lot of lead generation. I, do, I get a lot of business through referrals, um, you know, whether it's through Instagram or Facebook. I get, I get, you know, while I don't have an enormous amount of followers on Instagram or social media or in general, LinkedIn, um, I get quite a few DMs um, <laughs> from people that don't even necessarily follow me. Hey, I see you're in franchising. I saw you advertise a CBD brand. You know, can, you, can we set up a call? Of course we could set up a call any, anytime. And I typically work seven days a week because I love it. You know the old expression, when you, get a, when you do something you love, you don't ever work a day in your life. You know, I could be in Hawaii right now. I could be in you know, anywhere talking to people about franchising. So I love it. So um, you know, for me, I love going on podcasts now. I'm, I'm becoming a professional podcast guest. This is my first face-to-face -face hey. live podcast with- uh, You're popping chairs on both sides. Video, you crossing off the video for me and then person <laughs> one for you. <laughs> popping, hashtag popping chairs. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, but I love what I do. And, and you know what, Jake? I love that. I, I talked about the nature versus uh, nurture before. Anybody can be a franchisee, but not anybody believes enough in themselves and has enough confidence in themselves to take that step forward or to take that step up to make that phone call or reach out to me for that first conversation. There are people that are scared. A lot of what I talk to people about is mindset because you might be gung ho and then you go to your family or if you're married or whatever it might be, whoever you would go to in your circle, what are you crazy? Why would you, what do you think you could run your own business? And I'll give you a perfect example. I had a doctor, very successful doctor came to me through referral. So I had a long call with him. And at one point in his call, he says to me, this was really helpful. Now I got to tell you something. You told me to really be fair and honest with you. So, because if, unless people are really, I hate to sound cliche, but you look at these TV shows, these goofy TV shows like the bachelor. And you hear things like, my wife loves watching that, Bachelor, Bachelorette. And what's the number one thing that people on the show talk about to be successful? You know, They talk about being vulnerable, mm. be authentic, be yourself, be honest, open up. And that's the exact same thing with me. If people tell me what they really feel, what they're really concerned about, I've been there, done that, I could help them so easily. Now, I also have a free assessment, which we can talk about later, that's on my website. It's pretty scientific that it'll, it'll determine, it'll take you about 15 minutes to do it, but it'll determine what your mindset is, your risk tolerance, your comfort zone or comfort level based on your skills, based on your history. And it'll, it's really like a compatibility slash mindset report that I get a, an amazingly detailed report and it even lines up some brands or categories that might be good for you based mm. on how you're answering these questions. And, uh, and with all of the questions I ask, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to start to figure out, you know, it might take me a couple of rounds. It's like me playing matchmaker for someone. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. And at the end of the day, I was mentioning this doctor. So he said to me, as he was being vulnerable, he says to me, I have to tell you, my wife told me I would be a horrible business owner. How sad is that? And I said to him, really? How do you feel about that? Do you feel you'd also be a horrible business owner? Well, no, but it really hurt me that she thinks that I wouldn't be good at this as a, uh, being a business owner. Now, the reality, not that this is a conversation about doctors, but there are doctors that work for themselves. Like my brother's a doctor and he works for himself. He's got a couple of hospitals and he's an animal doctor. 
And, but there were doctors that work for hospitals. So they're really an employee of the hospital, I have a contract with them, however that works. And that's easier because you just know what, when to show up, you still get paid great money, but not like if you were on your own. And that's what his history was. He had never worked for himself. So, and that's what his wife had noticed. You know, you're a really good employee, but you're not going to be good on your own. And that's not necessarily true. That's sometimes just a preconceived notion that somebody has because, you know, that's all, that's like seeing somebody that's overweight saying you're never going to be fit. Well, you can be whatever you really want to be. It's up to you. And I love to help people with that because, um, I, while I do believe people are born a certain way, kind of predisposed to something, there are other people that are born with not, maybe they have low self-esteem based on their history. Maybe they have a low, you know, low, their, their self-confidence is not great for whatever reason. And I just have to find a brand with a lot of support and a proven history to make sure those people will be successful. And I have many brands that are like that. And I have brands that are low cost as well, but, uh, but that's my favorite is finding the perfect franchise for a prospective franchisee that's truly looking for the first time. I also help plenty of people that are very successful that already own franchises franchises, and they want to diversify. You know, I helped somebody recently that owns a lot of restaurant franchises that wanted to get into this salon business because he's like, oh, enough about enough with food already. And I could tell you case story after case study after case study of successful people that I know in franchising. It's f the food industry, I would assume, is probably the most popular uh, fran franchisee. Truth be told, you're absolutely right. The restaurant business, uh, restaurant franchises are still, well, prior to the pandemic, they were absolutely still the most popular year over year. The second most popular are personal care brands. They call them personal care brands, like, you know, salons or lash lounges or uh, massage studios or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, so personal care is number two. Restaurants were always number one, but there's a lot of a lot of categories that are pretty pretty hefty, so to speak. You know, whether it's you know automotive or you know like Meineke is is doing really well today. Um, a lot of people love that brand. I have somebody that's probably doing a Meineke deal. Um, um, home health care or home care, um, non medical especially is amazing. Like it's projected. Any expert you ask will tell you it's going to grow straight up to thirty years. So who wouldn't want to get into a business that are when you're told, okay, this business will grow for 30 years straight up. Yeah. That's what everyone wants. And it's a low cost business mm -hmm. and nice profitability. And it's, uh, we have, I have probably 28, 29, maybe 30 now home care brands and some of them bigger than bigger than others in the Vegas market for the locals listening right now. There's quite a few of my brands that advertise on TV. And, you know, but it's about getting in the right territory and getting in there with the right brand, obviously. That makes sense. Do you partner or in your portfolio, are there any businesses that are only online or maybe necessarily don't have a physical dependence? Because right now we're seeing through the pandemic that commercial real estate is getting hammered really hard. And a yep. lot of companies are starting to turn to a different platform that isn't just brick and mortar. Um, so do you have anything like that that fits in your portfolio yes. and, how, and how are you uh, looking forward to this? Yes, yes. And yes. <laughs> so the interesting thing about franchising that happened 10 years ago, you'll have to probably, you'd be able to tell me what you think based on how I answer this, when this <laughs> would have happened. But when did technology really start coming about when everybody knew about Google and everybody had an email address and how long ago was that? Is that 12 say, years ago? I'd say about 10, 12 years. 10, 12. 2008, maybe like right after the economic crisis. Um, I'd say probably a little bit right after economic crisis because that's when, that's before the apps really took off. The iPhone was founded in 2008, so you give it a, See, a year or two, yeah. So I about. knew you would know this, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so technology, in my opinion, has really amplified the success of the franchise world. And I'll give you an example. If you were a moving company, in 2000, a moving company in 2000, how would they adver advertise? You might not even know because you're not even 30 yet. Mm -hmm. So not to, you know, I mean, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, it was the yellow pages. It was a yellow pages ad. Everybody had to be in the yellow pages or, or in, the, in the directory. People would still pick up the phone and call the operator to ask for a phone number, you know, whatever. So 
when technology sort of took over and Google, especially being the biggest search engine still today by far, um, those moving companies. So for example, I have a great franchise brand you might, might not have heard of called college hunks, hauling junk and moving. Never heard of it, but genius brand, great name, fun, great marketing college hunks, hauling junk and moving when the tech tech started coming on strong to this day. I mean, they crush the competition because of SEO search engine optimization. There's no longer yellow pages, but the new version of the yellow pages is really SEO. So anybody in a local market, if you want to move in Vegas, I don't even know if there is a college hunks. I don't think there is, even is a college hunks franchisee in Vegas. So I don't you, say I, I haven't, I haven't heard of it, but I've heard similar ideas. That's almost like on the opposite side of the, side of the spectrum, maybe 10, 20 years ago, where it was like the, the, um, the nannies who come and like clean your house. You yes. know, that's like the, the like woman <laughs> version of it. I was thinking of, that's literally the complete opposite side is having, you know, buff college guys come and well, uh, well, these are stuff around. Yeah, these aren't Chippendales types type guys. I think it's uh, and hunk is actually an acronym for you know what their culture is based on, which yeah, I won't that, I won't spoil that. The but, SEO got me already. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is the SEO um, puts college hunks. I want to say that a typical college hunks franchise franchisee gets about eighty percent of their business through referrals, either through the website or through the call center uh, of college hunks. And that's all because of technology today. And that's amazing. And a lot of brands are like that in that you're going to get referral business or you're going to go to a website for a brand. And just because you're part of that big brand that people know, you're going to get the business. Mm. You know, there's certainly brands that have national accounts with companies. And if you're the franchisee in the area, you're going to get that phone call for whatever that service is that you're providing. Um, so, uh, you know, technology has really changed uh, a lot of brands over the years. And as we got, went into the coronavirus, the pandemic, um, I, I have a funny story. I have a brand that is incredible. It's um, a combination of business networking, uh, leadership. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing company. And I'm not going to even tell you the name right now for a couple of reasons. But this company did nothing online. But they had franchisees out there in some major cities that were very successful bringing people to meetings on a weekly basis. Small membership fee to a larger membership fee, depending on how many people from your organization were coming, whether you were by yourself, whatever. But there was different services they offered. Incredible brand, but they did nothing online prior to coronavirus because they didn't need to. They, made, they were highly profitable, low-cost franchise. You could run out of your house, but you found a local place typically for free, which is part of their strategy because you're bringing entrepreneurs. So COVID hits and they go online, they go on zoom and they certainly have some money behind them. They didn't really like zoom because they do breakout sessions. They do some pretty unique things and they didn't really like zoom's breakout sessions or uh, capabilities. So they spent the money and are creating their own. They're almost done with it, but they're in the meantime, they're still using zoom. But the point is obvious at this point. They, I don't like using the word pivot. A lot of people use the word pivot. That's what I had in my mind. That's they exactly adapted the and they adapted very nicely and what all great entrepreneurs do and they created this model online. And the interesting thing that resulted, it was even more powerful, not more powerful than being in person, but it was more powerful because of the reach. So if you wanted to attend a meeting in the old days in their Phoenix market where they started, you, only, you had to get on a plane and go to Phoenix if you weren't in Phoenix. So if you're doing business development, you want to meet people in the Phoenix market, you'd have to go there. Well, guess what? Duh, mind blown. I could be on a call with all of these people in the Phoenix market. They get to know me. I get to know them. It's a very structured company. And because of coronavirus, this company is, out, is going to be even more outrageously successful because of the coronavirus. And I could tell you other examples of that. I have another company that is incredible um, that $62,000 is all it is to start out of your house. Very successful prior to the pandemic. You would go on face-to-face -face meetings, business to business, but that obviously has changed now to 
Zoom calls or just phone calls. And the corporation didn't like that. They, they, well, they, they are adjusting and they're fine with it now. But prior to the pandemic, they didn't like that. They liked the personal touch of being able to meet people and shake hands with people. Old school stuff. But now they're comfortable. They see the results. And the fact of the matter is the franchisees can be far more productive. There's no longer getting, you don't get stuck in traffic. You don't have to wait 15 minutes because somebody that you're seeing at an office is late. Um, so it's very, very efficient and productive. And they're loving it. Now, as an aside, before the pandemic, this is a brand that cost only $62,000 home-based. Is that is that pretty low in very comparative low. to starting up capital? Pretty well, pretty low considering an average fast casual restaurant's probably four fifty, four hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Wow, yeah. So, and not to mention, you can do it by yourself. You don't have to rely on employees. If you have some good inter interpersonal skills and some sales ability, you can be very successful. But here's the magic in this particular example I'm giving you. I was talking on talking. I was threatening that I might give some sort of case studies. This particular brand. There are franchisees on a $62,000 investment that actually net a million dollars a year Wow! from their house. Now, what I tell people is, although their documentation and their information would say, yeah, there are franchisees that net a million dollars a year, I said, who cares about that? What if you net 400000 a year or $300,000 a year off a $62,000 investment? Would that be okay for you? I'll take 800% any day. Exactly. Some people say, I'll, hey, if I can invest 62000 not to mention there's, there's financing. I have so many great franchise finance, you know, lenders out there. And typically you can put down as little as 25%. Now, depending on your situation and the particular brand, you can get sometimes put down as little as 15%. And all you need is a 680 credit score. That was literally gonna be my next question was, let's say you don't have the capital right off the bat. Um, what different services does ION offer to assist in that, in that procedure? We are completely full service. So, everything in the world of franchise finance. I have a slew of attorneys, not only franchise attorneys to help you if you have questions in an agreement. I offer agreements with the disclosure that I am not an attorney. I might play one on TV, but I'm not an attorney live and really. Um, but I've been doing this a really long time. In fact, I just got hired by an attorney in Florida to create an agreement for him with a brand. Because as an attorney, he's not a franchise attorney but he wants my advice on creating a franchise relationship with a franchise brand. So you have the experience. So because I have the experience and he asked me certain questions, he was referred by a friend. I'm not doing, I didn't, didn't refer him to this brand in the first place. Um, so that was, that's always nice when, you know, I, I know I have the credibility and authority in the space that people are calling me to help them with that. I do get frequent calls from friends of mine across the country that say, I'll give you a perfect example. I work with an amazing SBA lender that's a preferred SBA lender. They do their own underwriting. That's what that that's really- That's Small Business Administration. Small Business Administration. Yeah, okay. Um, and that, that is the, really the funding arm. These banks get guarantees through the SBA when they do an SBA loan, which is why they want to do it. They get this huge guarantee, which is like 75% of the loan is guaranteed by the government. So God forbid somebody failed, um, you know, the banks would be covered. But my, my good friend is a, is a big SBA lender in Nashville. And somebody called me and says to me, um, you know, this guy's been to multiple banks already, SBA lenders, and he keeps getting turned down. Is there anything you can do to help him? Because you seem to be able to get stuff done, which is true. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a get it done guy. And I said, well, I have one amazing, I have many good lenders, but let me call my guy in Nashville. He got him an $800,000 SBA loan over 800,000, 850 or whatever it might be. And, uh, and I feel good about that. In fact, now he's on uh, deal number two. He's on location number two already. Slowed down a little bit. This, the progress has slowed down a little bit through the coronavirus. But um, so yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a connector. I get it done. I have somebody for everybody. If somebody just wants attorneys, like I have a guy in upstate New York that was doing something. And he said, you know, I need an attorney to talk to you to recommend anybody. I said, yeah, here are the two attorneys I would recommend. Oh, did you want a franchise attorney? Did you want a business attorney on your setup? I have all of those. And you can do who, use whoever you want. But a lot of people like that I am completely turnkey and free. So 
that makes it that makes it better, right? Your free consultation is the best. I know a lot of people get turned away from that. Uh, when even when you look ten years ago, people are afraid to approach lawyers just because you're like, oh my god, they're going to charge me five hundred dollars, and I'm not even going to get anything out of it. Exactly, exactly. No, I'm I'm free. I mean, look, I I'm working on developing various courses because a lot of people come to me that know nothing about franchising, and I have no problem filling in anything they need to know about franchising. I've talked to a, a, a young lady who is about 30 two different times now, and each time has been an hour and a half, um, getting her comfortable. And she's fantastic. She's smart. She's asked the right questions. And now I've introduced her to a couple of brands, and she's on her way to picking which one she's going to partner with. She's so smart that she actually came to me already pre-approved for an SBA loan, which doesn't happen very often. I mean, there's a lot of people in the first phone call, we talk about financing, and you know, and, and then I refer them to my lenders if they would like. And, and you know, like buying a house, you want to make sure you're pre-approved before you start. You know, you don't want to get upset because you're looking at a certain brand and you realize you can't get qualified for it. So, um, and a lot of that, you know, look, SBA, the SBA lenders just want to make sure, for the most part, that the brand is on the SBA registry. So franchises, franchisors, do the appropriate paperwork and they file it with the SBA registry to be listed. And, and that gives a little or a lot more credibility to the process. And, and, and there's, there's a tracking mechanism in there. So if there's a brand that's not doing well and they've had defaults or too many defaults mm -hmm. on SBA loans, at some point, banks won't be able to lend for that particular brand. Yeah. They're almost, it's almost like a, like a red flag scenario. Like, look, Bingo. Over, look, look over here. That's look exactly here. right. That's exactly right. So when, Let's go on the opposite end. So when somebody has been running a successful business, let's say, you know, two years, three years, whatever the case is, and they come to you and they want to franchise out to their first specific location, is there a specific criteria that you look at as far as evaluating them? Is there a specific amount of time that you look to see yeah. if it's lapsed? Yeah, well, time isn't as important as, as who they are because why do people look at, why do people buy franchises? So I look at the sim similar qualities. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, a young lady came to me, not that, not that young, but she's certainly younger than me. Um, <laughs> super amazing, nice. She was referred to me recently by another client I just set up for franchising. And she owns a salon suites brand. So she builds out a salon and rents out the spaces and wants other franchisees to do the same. She's got a few locations in the Southeast, very successful. And she came to me and said, you know, I'm ready to franchise. And I listened to her and holy cow, was she ready to franchise? Now you ask the question, why was she in this case ready to franchise? Number one, she was absolutely an expert in her space. I listened to what she was saying, what she wasn't saying, asked her appropriate questions, and she is all dialed in. She has every system written down. Now, if you didn't have all your systems written down, but you can verbally tell me that you have your systems and understand your business, you're still ready to franchise because it'll take us minimum of 90 days to set anybody up, any independent business that's ready to franchise. It'll take us 90 days minimum to 120 days. I mean, we want the slow, slow track. We can, we can go six months if that's the case, but she was ready and she already did a competitive analysis of her competition. Um, there are a few other salon suites competitors in my portfolio. I don't necessarily give exclusives to anybody. I mean, I'm part of all these, these affiliations. And I looked and I was comparing fees and, you know, bottom line is those other two salon suites brands are, are do very well, but she, it's about secret sauce. Let me just tell you, it's, what is your secret sauce? What is going to make you successful where maybe someone else in the space wasn't as successful? And, and part of her secret sauce was that she created an amazing culture for these franchisees, an amazing amount of support. I shouldn't say, or I should say her employees because she didn't have franchisees at the time, but I knew that she would do the same thing for her franchisees, just a really good culture and feeling for her future franchisees and she was going to support them and she really was going to take her time in the selection process and was going to do everything right just like she did with her team so 
And, the, and her secret sauce was that it was a low cost salon suites brand, not cheap, not inexpensive. It was just low cost. She didn't want to be a $450,000, dollars $500,000 investment. She wanted to be much, much lower, and she found a way to do that, you know, and, and that's part of her secret sauce, if you will. Um, but look, you do have to have a history of some sort of success. You do have to have some brand awareness. She absolutely has brand awareness in her area. And if you ever notice, why do brands that are newer, why do they tend to branch out in their area first rather than running across the country? Because of brand awareness. Yeah, localism. Localism. She is in the Southeast. So in her area, she's already got a list of 10 people that, that seriously want to franchise with her. Now, legally, franchising is regulated by the federal government. So if it was a licensing deal, which is pretty loosey-goosey and you can't exercise much control, um, franchising is about exercising control. We can talk a little bit more about that, which is good for everybody. It's kind of like living in an H HOA. Some people like it. Homeowners Association, some people hate it. Haven't dove into it yet, but I'm kind of turned the other way at this moment. <laughs> well, you know, some people could argue that for property values, the HOAs might mm. keep things in line. You can't have excessive weeds or you can't have, you know, 700 cars sitting in front of your house that are broken down or whatever. Um, but it's just a silly little analogy of mine. But in this case, um, you know, most people, when they start franchising, look in their neighboring states first um, because they know that there's going to be brand awareness. Um, you can go across the country if you want, if the brand is that strong and you have a great social media presence. Like, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a restaurant brand right now with one location and they have over 100,000 people following them on Instagram and they're officially Instagram certified. With the blue little, uh, what is it, a star? Or yeah, the, the, the blue verified check marketing. Yeah. How do you like that? One location, one restaurant, they already have that because they're like, you know, legendary already. So they could easily go across the country just with their Instagram account. Um, they can go across country and set up shop right away if they wanted to. So, um, you know, look, franchising is an amazing way to build wealth and build equity for yourself. Because if you're a small business owner doing really well, making hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year from your business. Um, you know, it, it requires quite a bit of capital and a, quite a bit of energy to build another location and another location, but doing it through the franchise process where you're bringing people on with their capital it's a helping hand and your knowledge, it's an absolutely incredible system. Now there are people that don't like it for whatever reason. And, and that's their issue. I think, um, there are a lot of misconceptions about franchising. Some people think, I had a guy say to me the other day, I thought you had to be a millionaire to be a franchisee. And I was like, well, no, there are franchises. You do have to have quite a that's bit of money. <laughs> and that's okay. There are a lot of people that think that. And, and, and I understand those misconceptions. I have another guy that said to me, well, aren't franchises like a scam? A scam. I don't know where that one came from. But, you know, look, in any business, there's going to be failures. And most of the failures in franchising are that the franchise brand might have selected the wrong franchisee because people tell a good story. You know, what's the old expression in the interview process? The person you're interviewing, so if you're interviewing somebody from, for a job, they're typically going to be the best they're ever going to be at the interview. Yeah, it's the top. Because, you know, the old, I mean, fake it till you make it. You have to either... Some people embellish, some people... So let's say there's a smoker. Let's say you're in a situation where you're in a, a you know retirement home and people are smoke sensitive, just crazy little example. And somebody comes from an, for an interview and they smell like smoke. Is that person going to work in that environment? Probably not. Now, some people would know that they shouldn't smell like smoke in an interview, so they don't smell like smoke in the first interview but then they get called back for a second interview and a third interview. I always like doing three interviews, no matter what three different times, three different touches, so to speak, that you get to see somebody. Yeah. And then they're smoking on their smoke break every day during their shift. It, it, like, it, where did this come from? But, but at least if you get a chance to interview them three times, mm -hmm. maybe they, and they, they don't smell like smoke three times or there's no red flags. Maybe they'll be okay. But it's amazing that all of a sudden you hire somebody and they show up for work and they smell like smoke. <laughs> and, uh, and that's just an example. Look, I'm, 
plenty of smokers in my family still as much as they shouldn't be smoking. Uh, it's just, you know what it is, what it is. So, um, where were we? So, you know, with, with franchisees setting up, I, I love helping independent business owners growing and scaling through franchising is just, is just a no brainer. I mean, now the best part about this, Jake, is that when you have, let's say you have a, a few salon suites like this, this lady does, and then she sells a couple of franchises. So over the years, her royalty stream, so let's say she's collecting 5% royalty, 6%, 7%, whatever it is. That is her cash flow. And a franchisor like her is worth a multiple of her cash flow. And, you know, I, I know brands, young, young brands that get sold for 10 times cash flow. That's typically the number that these private equity groups will buy you out at. It's 10 times your cash flow. So I don't know. I'd have to do the math to tell you how many locations based on her average unit volume, her current sales, that she'd have to sell to be worth $20 million. I mean, I hate to say it's that simple, but it's that simple. Wow. You have to be passionate enough to create a business with some sort of proprietary system or secret sauce, if you will. In her case, she has a secret sauce, and that's that's her mm -hmm. and her system and you know the low-cost build-out, the brand awareness. It's, there's a lot, of, a lot of pieces. Some of them are sort of intangible. And some of them are absolutely tangible and she's going to be very successful. Yeah. I wish her luck. Uh, touching on brand awareness while you, you were talking about this, there's, there was one popular West coast burger joint that I kept thinking of the whole time. In and yeah. out. In and out. In and, yeah, out. In, in and out is, in and out can open anywhere tomorrow. And yeah, but out. they started only West coast brand awareness. They stayed local and then just the few neighboring states until they became a dominant. And then well, I'll then give you a fun fact for you there. So I've consulted for a lot of different companies over the years, um, kind of as a, a hired gun to help with various projects. And I, I did join a brand in California a while ago. And um, I got to meet, well, years ago, I was also with Fatburger as an officer and helping them with their expansion many years ago. I think it was probably 2000, if I remember correctly. That's, they were popping back then. They, they were. Um, and so I got to know a lot of uh, a lot about In-N-Out because In-N-Out started in 1948. Fatburger started in 1952. Um, but I got to know the family that owns the bakery that makes the buns for In-N-Out Burger. Also, fun fact, that bakery is the same bakery that makes the buns for Fat Burger. In and Out's the only one that actually talks about the bun being a sponge dough and, and what it is. But the reason I mention that is um, a lot of restaurant companies, uh, and, it, and, it, and it just depends on their menu, but in In and Out's case, the real reason that they didn't expand quickly across the country was in, in the earlier days, certainly distribution. They told that bakery. Um, in Southern California, we want to go to Texas. So can you go put up a, a bakery? Can you go open a bakery in, in Texas? Ah, so they were limited. Exactly. So they did. They did. And then, you know, a year and a half, two years later, when the bakery's up and running, that's when in and out found their first location in Texas. Um, and, you know, typically when a restaurant chain gets set up in the Midwest in Texas, it's kind of pretty easy to go east or west coast mm -hmm. once you're in Texas. Um, but, you know, in and out uses fresh meat. Right now, last I checked, they still have only one production facility that makes that meat. Um, eventually, if they're going nationwide, which they will eventually, they're going to have multiple uh, meat companies, like Shake Shack, for example, has good quality meat. They're across the country. They're on both coasts. And and Shake Shack has, I think, three different meat vendors now. I, love, I fucking love In-N-Out, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't eat fast food often, but if I do go eat burgers, it's definitely In-N-Out. Yep, I, but, lo I love In-N-Out. I mean, look, for the money, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I do want to touch back, though, to the previous conversation. Um, I'm really curious, I'm sure a bunch of listeners are too, about the dynamics of negotiating the deal once you franchise out and create another business. The, and we were talking about the power structure. Um, so for the owner who's you know, the franchisor and they're expanding outwards. Is it just a, a royalty income? Does that person who then runs other business, are they just paying for just the name and the brand yeah. and, and the sort of speak the network that surrounds it? Certainly a great question. So 
as a franchisor, when you own a brand, you are a, a, a franchising relationship is, is really a licensing deal and not to be confused with a straight licensing deal where there's no control and you're buying a product. You've everybody's seen a lot of that on shark tank, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a licensing deal versus whatever else. And so a franchise is a license deal. You have a right to use the name. So if you buy a McDonald's franchise, you're using the name, you're using the uniforms, you have, the right to use all the vendors. In fact, you're mandated to use all the vendors. You can't go to Costco and get your meat because you found a better deal. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So that's where this control comes in. Franchisors get to, get to exercise a reasonable amount of control, which is all contractual. Um, and when I say reasonable, on the human resources side, um, they don't. You're responsible for hiring. Their folks need to fit within the training guidelines and standards of, in this case, McDonald's. So as a franchisor, you collect, every franchisor collects some sort of franchise fee. If it is a franchise, there needs to be a fee collected up front. And that fee is, well, for some brands, it's a profit center. They make some money on it. Other brands, not so much. Other brands just, they want to collect, they need to collect a franchise fee because especially if you're a restaurant company and you're, let's say, based in Las Vegas and you sign a franchisee in New York, you now have to send, when the time is right, when the building gets ready, you have to send a training team to New York. You pay for flights, you pay for the salaries, you pay for food while they're there. Um, and you know, you're supporting that franchisee across the country. They might need a rental car, whatever other kind of transportation. So it gets really expensive when people are flying across the country to support a franchisee in an opening, especially in the restaurant business. There are many other brands that I have that are, you know, like you were alluding to earlier, especially these days. So much is virtual these days. Mm -hmm. A lot of the training is virtual, especially during times like this, where maybe it was all face-to-face -face before, but they quickly adapted and got everything online. And then through Zoom, you could feel like, or any other online, you know, uh, recording app you can feel or a live face-to-face -face app, I should say, video. Video app. conferencing. That's the word, video <laughs> conferencing. Thank you. You, you, can, you can make it through, simple. Um, and it feels like you're face-to-face. -face. What, what better? So a franchisor um, collects a franchise fee from the franchisee. The franchise fee could be $20,000, it could be $60,000. But it's a one-time fee. The royalty is what a franchisee would pay to a franchisor on an ongoing basis. And royalties are typically, and it's a percentage of your sales. It's not a percentage of your profit. It's a percentage of your, your net sales. Uh, really, it's your gross sales minus tax is what most of the agreements say. And the percentage could be 5%, 3%, 4%, 7%. Some brands do a sliding scale where they, well, they might say it's uh you know, $250 a month or $500 a month or $1,500 a month, whatever it is. Everybody does it a little, little bit differently. Uh, brands like Sonic years ago were doing like a sliding scale. If you did a certain amount of sales in a week, you'd pay 5%. If you did a higher amount of sales, you'd pay less. Or, you know, there were, there were different, different rhymes and reasons and ways to do it. But the bottom line is really br franchisors make their money on royalties. That's the bottom line. And, you know, so if you are a prospective franchisee, there are people that have, have said, like I have fran prospective franchisees say to me on a pretty regular basis, well, why would I pay the franchisor $35,000 in a franchise fee when I can do it myself? Well, you can absolutely do it yourself. That was literally my next question. You can absolutely do it yourself, but you don't know everything. And you're missing out on the networking as well. You're missing the support. out. You, you, well, Jake, you're very smart because that's one thing a lot of people don't talk about is the networking. When you're in a system with millionaires, and every franchise brand, there are the top 20% that are incredibly successful operators. So the top 20% of McDonald's, oh, they're, they're making lots of money. And that goes for every brand. The top 20% of every brand I have, maybe they're only making $100,000 a year and some smaller brands, the top 20% makes 100, 150,000. But if their investment's 25, what do you care? You know, it's all about return on investment. So 
you have so many benefits of being part of a franchise organization. You're going to get marketing support. You're going to get training support. You're going to get told, don't do this, and this is why. <laughs> we know how to be successful. It's just like I could write a, I will be writing several books, but, you know, in the restaurant business, what not to do. You know, why was I so successful with Wingstop? Why was I so successful with Krispy Kreme as an operator when other people weren't? Well, sure, it's about location, but it's also about your people. And that's one of my specialties. People would always ask me, how do you find, how do you find such great people? And that's a whole other podcast. But, you know, I always said I like to discover people. Like, what do you mean discover people? Well, I don't just sit around and wait for people to come in. I don't just put ads out and expect great people to show up. I go find them. Well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is once I have a location, I go around to, and, you know, so let's say there's a Starbucks right near my new location or, a, you know, a sandwich shop or whatever it might be. I'll go there, get some food, get a drink, whatever. If there's any nice staff that I observe that do a great job, because, you know, catch, catch them doing something right. So that's how they'd be for you if they're doing something right, right? Yeah. So I, I say, hey, Jake, you know, you're a nice guy. Uh, I'm opening such and such right down the block here, and uh, I'm looking for great employees just like you. Obviously, I'm not recruiting you. That would be unprofessional. However, a nice guy like you have to have friends or family that might be looking for a job. It could be just as good as you. So here's my card. Have them have them reach out. And I've staffed out of state based on that one one technique alone. I like that technique. Uh, they always say that your character shows best when no one's watching. And then that's, when you think no one's watching, that's when you're watching. <laughs> that's exactly right. And again, anybody can fake it in an interview, and but they can't really fake it. If somebody's giving you fantastic service while they're on the job, that's how they're going to be to your employees too. So catch and find those people and you will have great employees attracted to you because what are they also going to say? I'm not a dummy. I am obviously going to be very, very nice as I'm asking Jake at the coffee shop for referrals essentially. And Jake's going to say, Hey Susie, this really nice guy, Lance just came in. He said he's opening something down the block and I know you're looking, this might be a good opportunity for you. Bingo. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the franchise, but the franchise world as a prospective franchisee, the franchise fee is that one time upfront fee to give you the keys to the kingdom, to give you the system, to give you the secret sauce, to give you the ability to wear that logo, to give you the training and support that you'll need on an ongoing basis. And the goal of every very well respected franchise group is that they need to make you successful because every year they update their franchise disclosure documents that are required to be handed via email to every prospective franchisee. And there's 23 different items in there. And a lot of those, well, all of those items have certain, have different meanings. Um, but there's, there's one that talks about how much it costs to open what the range is, you know, from low to high, including working capital. And, and then there's other pieces like the item 19 is the financial representation section or the, what's called the earnings claim. So brands don't want anything damaged. God forbid they have to close a uh, franchisee has to close up. That has to be disclosed, disclosed in there. And that's a black eye on the brand. Especially if they want to go public at the end of the day, if they're, if they're big man. Big, bigger brand. Well, and that is the goal for some brands, uh, for sure. But just for the simple fact that they're selling franchises and wanting to continue to sell franchises, um, you need to make your franchisees successful. So the better brands are really hyper, super focused on that. Now, there are some other young, younger brands or older brands. It, could, it doesn't have to be just a younger emerging brand that... I don't match people up with. They might be a great brand for certain people, but not others. Huh. So one of the, one of the last questions before we get out of here, um, one concern that I would have, and I'm sure that franchisors bring this up to you or even the franchisees is that once they start creating multiple brands across the country, is there any sort of mechanism or procedure to prevent the dilution of the brand? Um, like, you know, the kind of the story speak where they spread someone super thin and maybe the values of the company aren't translated outwards to every specific brand that they'd like. 
you actually asked a question with a lot. There's a lot to unpack in that. And that's a great, great question. And, and let me answer it this way. Um, so the, so let's, let's start with the first part of this. When you are a prospective franchisee and I, I show you various brands and you have your first conversation with the leadership of that particular brand, you know, you have to trust and believe, you know, there's an old expression, trust the process. And you have to trust and believe that they are the right people for you. In the franchise disclosure document and the actual franchise agreement is what you sign for your particular territory or location. Every brand does territories a little bit differently depending on what you are and who you are. So if you're a restaurant, for example, there's typically um, a radius clause. So in the old days when I was doing Wingstop, if I remember correctly, well, I had the I had the rights to Clark County, so there was nobody that was going to infringe, and that's the legal term, <laughs> infringement on your on your territory. But it, you know, typically it might say something like, you know, you have a three mile radius or one hundred and fifty thousand in population, and you can also take a map and draw boundaries like north of Sahara, east of this, west of this. So these either physical barrier uh, boundaries or, uh, you know, population, or, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do radiuses and, and, uh, and territory mapping, but you bring up an interesting, really interesting question because, or comment, because when I was with Krispy Kreme, one of the things that they did wrong was they were too aggressive. You mentioned dilution. They were too aggressive. So they sold a group in Southern California, a large, well, all of Southern California. They had another group that had Northern California. That wasn't, there's nothing wrong with either of those points. One person has Southern, one person has Northern. They both had plenty of money. The problem was they had, a, they had an aggressive development agreement that said you had to build all of these stores, and it was a lot in Southern California, and that was wrong. Nobody knew at the time it was wrong, but it was wrong. It's kind of like saying, you know, there's Disney World and Disneyland. There's only two in the United States. There should be 10. Well, I think most people would argue that's probably not a good idea. That would take the specialness, if that's a word, out of it. It, it. it needs to, that's not good. And so Krispy Kreme destroyed itself in those days. It's still a great brand and people still like eating those donuts, but it wasn't a great move for the franchisees and it caused a lot of pain. There were bankruptcies because all of a sudden you open a store that cost a fortune to open. I mean, just the equipment alone in a Krispy Kreme in those days when I was with Krispy Kreme was about $355,000 to be exact was just the equipment package, not even building the building or anything else. So you get my point. Mm -hmm. So that was something self-imposed. Krispy Kreme did that to themselves. So when you are talking to a brand, you can use me as leverage as well because I know all this, years in it. And I can help because I might be able to get you a bigger territory if you weren't comfortable with the territory that was laid out. Um, but then you have another side of it. I know a, a friend of mine has some restaurants in, in town that are franchises, and he was very successful with them. All of a sudden, one day, there's another restaurant with his name on it that he doesn't own, obviously, that opens a lot closer to him than he wanted. Now, let me just throw it out there. It's in the news, but Quiznos. Quiznos was very much guilty of infringement of a few times too many where they started allowing stores to open too close to each other. And then what happened? Even if you had a good Quiznos with good sales, all of a sudden you lost 20% of your sales because somebody else opened. That could have been all your profit. So that is problematic in franchising if you don't ask the right questions and understand all that on the front side. See, all of this can be covered in the beginning. You'll know up front what is your territory. So if you have a restaurant, you know, it might be better to have physical barriers, boundaries, I should say, in your agreement so you know and feel comfortable that, all right, yeah, you can build another one, but as long as it's on the other side of that street, I'm good. I feel comfortable because it's realistic if you're not getting an exclusivity in an area or what's called an area development agreement where you have multiple unit agreement, it's reasonable that the brand can put other people there, but
but how close you just have to feel good about it. So that's just part of the process. It's just, it's just really truly part of the process of being a franchisee that are you having an exclusive of some kind, or are you going to cohabitate with other franchisees down the road? Like in Vegas, McDonald's, there's plenty of corporate stores. There's plenty of franchise stores, but McDonald's has been around long enough to understand how it works. How far away can they really be? What does the traffic need to be on the street in front of the McDonald's to generate certain sales? They know all these metrics. And there are software, real estate development software programs, major companies that do this for a living. They take the most successful stores, let's say of McDonald's, that do $3 million a year, really successful McDonald's. And they dissect why it's successful based on the real estate. They know how many cars pass every day. They know where people live. They know pe where people work. And then they, what they do is they mimic that. They clone that location in any other town in America. So just because Las Vegas has a $3 million McDonald's, let's say, they can go to Kansas and find a location just like that one. They might only have one. They might have two. But they can find another location just like that. So that's where technology has also helped with site selection and taking some of the guesswork out of things. But you know, that's some of the bigger companies as well. Yeah, Hopefully so, that answered it. Yeah. So they have uh, multiple secret sauces. Absolutely. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools that are available to these franchisors to really help people. And that's, what's important that you don't necessarily get on your own. Well, you taught me a ton about franchising. I had no <laughs> idea. There was a lot of misconceptions. The biggest one was that I thought you needed a large amount of capital right in the beginning to start $20,000. And I could find you something that is a good starter franchise. You might not, I mean, you might do it forever, but there's, you might kind of, it's like getting a house. You can get one house that's might, might be only 200,000 today. And then X amount of years, you're in a $400,000 house or more. Yeah. And then once, uh, as technology progresses, you'll probably see multiple other franchise industries evolve with it as well and open up, you know, events or, um, whatever weird tech things are created in apps nowadays? There, there are so many. We have digital marketing companies that are very successful. I have a digital marketing company based in Canada. They have a thousand franchisees. They've been around for 18 years or so. Wow. All right, cool. So I always ask two of the same questions to everyone on the way out. The first one is the year is 2030. What does the ecosystem of Ion franchising look like? 2030, we have, we're already spreading. You know, I work out of an office in Atlanta as well as Miami. Can you franchise a franchise too? Uh, sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the ecosystem is that, that we're just going to blow up. Franchising is just going to keep growing and growing. By that time, I'll have a, have my own popular franchising podcast yeah. that will be number one in French in the franchise world. Of course, by 2030, 10 years I have, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. And, uh, you know, I'll, we'll just have, have people everywhere and uh, I'll have a full blown uh, university set up for franchising. So anybody can certainly go online at any time, 24 seven and help educate themselves on franchising so they can feel comfortable from the convenience of their own home. Uh, there is no such thing as a dumb question. Sometimes people feel awkward asking me uh, many, many questions. And I am on the phone with people for hours at a time, sometimes. And, uh, and, and the, that sort of franchising university setup that I'm going to be working on soon enough will be really helpful. So that'll be pretty well known by that time. I like that. Uh, I have been saying a lot recently that I think trade schools and specialized universities are going to be the next wave with um, the degradation of well, academia overall. So correct you are. And that's, we were starting to talk about that earlier mm -hmm. when I mentioned the restaurant skills, although UNLV is a great hospitality school and Cornell, still the two best. There aren't a lot of schools that are really teaching those appropriate, you know, skills. Um, and, and people tend to just learn it on the job. I mean, like me, I had a college degree in economics and got into the restaurant business and, and really, you know, felt good about my skills after that when I could have learned some of this in college and I didn't. Couldn't agree more. I'm sitting here with a kinesiology degree. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, both, we're both in the Wait, same boat. My neck, my neck. <laughs> you can fix that later. <laughs> Last question is, what does Las Vegas mean to you? Las Vegas is home. I mean, uh, years ago, as I told, told everybody in my story, uh, I ended up in Phoenix 
Phoenix was a little bit sleepy for me. It's a great big city today. But when I hit Vegas, Vegas felt like little New York for me in, you know, 25 years ago. And, and it still is. It felt like home. And, you know, you have the food, you have the great people. It's, it's the melting pot of the United States. People are from everywhere. And, and I did really like that about New York and uh, that piece. And uh, so I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have raised my kids here. And, you know, the only thing Vegas is miss missing is the beach. As I get older, having grown up very close to the beach, that's what I miss. But, uh, right now, we'll have to settle for Encore Beach Club or Mandalay Bay Beach. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> How can uh, everyone, the listeners, get connected with you and Ion Franchising? Ion Franchising on Instagram. That's Ion Franchising. Uh, my website, ionfranchising.com. Definitely go there and do the free assessment. The assessment is uh, just scroll down a little bit, take you about 15 minutes. It will help me determine what is most compatible and best for you. Um, it's a good foundation. Start a, conversa start a conversation with me, but I'm free and I'd love to talk with you. Uh, I love that. Lance, thank you so much for this. This was awesome. Thank you, um, Jake, for right, having me. No doubt this is going to be a successful podcast and down in the future, um, hopefully we can partner up somewhere else and have you on later down the road. Uh, absolutely. Well, there'll have to be a part two. So that most definitely will. <laughs> thank you guys for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.